أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to session 10 of our eschatology podcast and what I want to look at today inshallah is subjectivity and objectivity and many might think that this is a really a redundant topic. In fact, it is one of the main chapters in my book, The One-Eyed Imposter, Messiah and False Messiah, is one of the primary chapters that is included in the very beginning of the book, which I argue that without understanding the, dif- the concept itself and the distinction between these two, subjectivity and objectivity, you really cannot venture a study in eschatology. You may be able to memorize all the hadith and all the ayat and all the various opinions and books and, and lectures and sayings and approaches and everything, the methods. You can basically have the entire encyclopedia in your head, but to really penetrate the depth of understanding in the subject, you need to be able to distinguish between a subjective truth and an objective truth. In the last session, I mentioned two terms. I spoke about haqiqa and I spoke about waqiya. Now, waqiya is realistic. It is not real itself, as I explained. And haqiqa is the thing that you really want to arrive at. So the haqiqa, the haq is the truth. The fact that is established on the truth, because facts themselves are not inherently true. So just because you have a fact does not necessarily mean that you have the truth because the fact can be true and the fact likewise can also be false. Truth itself must be able to withstand the motion of time and the changes and the vicissitudes of time. What could be a fact today might not be a fact tomorrow or what could be factually true today might not be factually true tomorrow something that may not have been established as factually true before might now become established as factually true. So my point is that facts can change because facts are subjective and facts themselves are not the truth, rather they are established or derived from the truth. So you have a truth and then you establish a fact from that. So the truth in this case is ultimately what you want to seek out, not the facts. The facts themselves become void and they lose their value when the real objective is far more valuable. Al-Haq is what the Muslim, the believer, wants to arrive at. Now, as far as Al-Haq is concerned, there are distinctions about the Haq as well. Because you can have different types of truths. In this, language plays a dominant role. The words that I'm using, they can also be deceiving. There is something as a hierarchy of truth or a type of truth and there is also something as a version of truth. A version of truth is not the truth. At the same time, a distinction of truth or a difference of truth is also not the truth. So we have truths and then we have the truth. The truth is what we call yaqeen or haqqul yaqeen. That is the absolute truth. The absolute truth is, is the truth that does not change, that does not alter, that is not, that is not dependent on what you think of it or your perception of it. It is not dependent on how well you derive it or understand it. It is not dependent on the changes and circumstances that take place in time. It is independent. So the Quran, for example, is an absolute truth because whether you recite it and understand it in the first century of Hijri or the second century or the 10th century or now in the 14th century of Hijr, 1400 years later, you still have the same universal understanding of what the ayat are saying. They have not changed in their essential truth. They may appear to be applicable to certain particular incidences at different times, but in their essential truth, they have not changed. That is the universal or the absolute truth, al haqqul yaqeen. And then you've got al haqq al-mawdu'iyya. 
which is now a haq that is objective. It is distinctive or it is separated from the individual's haq or the individual's truth, which is now a al haq al nafsiya. Al haq al nafsiya is the subjective truth. It is from the nafs. It is the perspective or the nazar. The nazariya is different from haqiqa itself. So you could be looking at something and understanding something by it, but what it really is is not the same as what you think it is. And what we mean by this is that the truth is not what you suppose it to be or what you think it should be. The truth is what it is or what it really is. And your understanding of it could be true or could be wrong or right or wrong. It could be true or could be false. It could be right or it could be wrong. Your understanding of it is a subjective understanding. Any version of the truth or any variance of the truth is not the truth itself. It is a lie inherently until it is finalized or all the, all the variations are removed from it. So your version of the truth and my version of the truth, both of these are not true. They are versions of the truth. They are not the truth itself. For us to come to the truth itself, our truths should be the same. Your understanding and my understanding and everybody else's understanding should be the same insofar as what reality unveils. So if we're looking at a spoon and one person says, no, I don't think it's a spoon. I think it's a small spade. And somebody else says, no, no, I don't think it's a small spade. I think it is just a piece of metal. Or someone else says, no, I think it is a sharpening tool. Or somebody says something else. All those may be factual to different degrees, to varying degrees. Some may be, may be closer to the truth. Some may be further from the truth. All those are versions of the, what the thing really is, but they are all lies. They are not the truth itself. And until unless we come to a common understanding or the same understanding of what that thing really is, not what we arbitrarily establish it to be, then and only then are we aligned or our understanding is aligned to al haqqul yaqeen the absolute truth of it. Even then it doesn't end there because we're only looking at a physical object. We then also have to look at the metaphysical, the ontological, the teleological understandings of that. So it doesn't just stop there. Why is this of importance? Let's look at an event that, that has happened. Take one of the most recent events that has happened, which is the Circus 19. On a side note, I just want to mention that I was the one who invented the term uh, in one of my lectures and somehow it just got picked up from there. And I think it's a fitting term because essentially this is what it was. It was a whole drama and all the theatrics and it, it was a circus in essence. Anyway, take that example in this case. It's a viral outbreak, right? We've examined this and we've said that the actual outbreak, it can be debated. And it was debated, still being debated, whether it was a natural occurrence or it was artificially induced, you know. So people were getting sick, people were getting the disease and people were getting harmed by it and people also were dying from that. So that is verifiable because it, there's no version of it. Now, the real question is in this case, was it a natural occurrence or was it staged? Was it instigated to happen? That in itself the debate of that subject itself is the deception. Part of the deception is to get you engaged in trying to figure out the nature of the deception. If you failed to understand the nature of it from the onset, from the very beginning, if you are not able to see it coming from afar and you're still trying to debate on that as people still are debating on it, is part of the deception because the intent behind it is to keep the mind preoccupied while something else is transpiring somewhere else. That's part of the deception. So while the world is now caught up in trying to deliberate either this or that, was it like this, was it that, you see? Everything else that is causal effectual to that occurrence, the periphery of it, things that were interconnected to it and were manifesting or and are still manifesting in different aspects surrounding it, people are actually clueless of that taking place because their entire focus is on this particular piece. Why is their focus on this particular piece? They're debating on this is because they do not have an objective understanding of it. Each individual is coming to the table to debate their own subjective understanding of it. I think it was like this. No, no, I think it was like that. So you're caught up in this subjective level of push and pull of causes and effects. 
In other words, what is evidently transpiring within the field of view may be factually true. I think it's like this. It, I think it's like that. It may be factually, you could have the facts and the other person has their own facts, but because it is the only thing that is happening within your field of view, you have to understand that it does not negate everything else that is happening around its periphery. That is examining it objectively. So yes, the event took place. Yes, all these things are happening. Yes, we can still debate as to the nature of it. But if we're caught up in the subjectivity of it, the semantics, the particulars, then our attention is drawn away from that is objectively happening around it. What else is manifesting alongside it? I, I don't want to go too deep into the particular event. What I want to draw your attention to is the fundamental rule, a fundamental rule of the study of eschatology. And as far as an axiom of the truth is concerned, is that the element of truth that is contained in a deception is always, always a subjective truth. Nothing more. The element of truth because every deception does have a construct of truth within it for the deception to be accepted it may be facts it may be sound logic whatever it may be it has been placed there in order to give you the impression that there is some truth to that thing that it's not in itself a deception so there is an element of truth there but that truth is always always a subjective truth it is not an absolute truth. It is not an objective truth. Falsehood itself cannot be constructed on absolute truth. An absolute truth itself cannot be manipulated. It is absolute. As a believer, that should be your focus. That should be the ambition. Anything that appears before you as being particulate, as being subjective, is not something you want to cling to because it will deceive you. Part of its existence is to deceive you, whether it is coming from the deceiver himself or it is a natural occurrence of the world of causality. It will deceive you, it will distract you from the ultimate objective, the main objective. Now, it is important to understand that the secular world, secular philosophy, does not recognize objectivity, nor does it recognize absoluteness. All of their arguments, whether it is in the arguments of the sciences or the arts, academic arguments, political, whatever it is, all their arguments are based on the idea that truth is subjective. And that's where they stop, full stop. Truth is subjective as far as they're concerned. That is the only valid position of truth. There is no such thing according to them as absolute truth or an objective understanding of reality. So if you're looking for the truth in some secular philosophy or some source that is from that origination, whether it is the news, the media, whatever it might be, if you're looking for truth from those sources, then you're looking in the wrong places. You will not find truth from there. The only source of truth is that which comes from revelation or the only source of absolute truth is that which comes from revelation. If you're going to apply your understanding of what you got from the world itself and then apply that to the Quran, for example, and expect to have yaqeen from that, to have truth from that, you will not get it. And a lot of people do this. Whenever there's a fitna occurs, whenever something happens, whether it is war, whether it is some sort of oppression taking place, whether it is Circus 19, or it is Israel invading Gaza, or, or, or you know, entering the uh, Al-Aqsa compound, and they look at this, this is an occurrence that is happening in phenomena, it is when the occurrence takes place, is when they look at all the sources of information that are supplied to them. Whether it is from the mainstream media or it is from all these videos that get circulated or all the memes that are shared, you know, on the Facebook College of Arts or on the International Institute of Twitter. Or of course, there is also the Islamic University of WhatsApp. You know, when they are being shared across all these, they take these things and then they start looking at revelation and they start looking at hadith and, and Quran and they start establishing certain understandings, you know, is the Mahdi here? Is the Mahdi coming? You know, is, is why is the Muslim army, where is the Khilafah? They start asking these kind of very stupid questions in my view, you know, and, and then the event passes and then they all go back to their normal lives. And then six months later, something else happens and they go back to the same cycle again. 
and they start doing the same thing. What you're doing in this case is you are floating in the stew of subjectivity. You are inside the pot. You're in the pot. The deceiver has put you in the pot. You are one of those ingredients that are in there stirring the pot and you are in the murkiness of it and you're trying to figure out what it is. What is really happening? Well, why am I swimming here? What's going on? See, this is the pot of confusion that he wants to put you in and he's brewing a stew of confusion. You're in the pot. You cannot understand what is being cooked. Until and unless you are out of the pot, when you're examining something objectively from an external perspective is when you will be able to understand. So long as you're within the fray, you will not understand what is happening. You're only going to be dealing with the elements that are in the fray, the subjective elements, those facts that you think are absolute truth. So I want to leave you with four pieces that are very important that are going to give you at least some understanding or some sort of framework in which you can operate. The first and foremost is that you should never assume the stance of accepting anything that you are that you receive from this world. This phenomenal world, this material world, you should not accept anything from this world as an absolute truth. Nothing. Not even what I'm saying to you right now, or, or what your mufti or your imam at the masjid was saying to you, or what your mom and dad or anything, any information that you receive from this world is plainly put, strictly information. You should not accept that as absolute truth. You need to be able to identify though, the one who is delivering it, whether that person is truthful, whether the person is honest, whether the facts there are making sense, whether there is logic to what is being presented, but you need to assume foremost that that is information that you are receiving and information remains information until it is verified by the source of absolute truth. So you do not take anything that you receive, whether it's from news and media, what is for whatever source it is from, the, the, the Facebook College of Arts or the International Institute of Twitter or the, the Islamic University of WhatsApp or Telegram or any of these other sources, you do not take that as truth. You need to validate it. You need to look for the source. You need to verify the truth of it and the source of, of that information and the truth of that source, the authenticity of that source. This is step one, the validation of information. Then you have to apply an epistemology. An epistemology is the method by which you come to know what you know. It is the knowledge or the branch of knowledge that examines knowledge itself. How do you know what you know? And how do you know that what you know is the truth? How do you know that what you know is the truth so that belief in that truth can be justified. The process of knowing is of the utmost importance. And we have in Islam, if you're a Muslim, you have something that is called an Islamic epistemology. And we spoke about this in the one of the earlier sessions when I spoke about the Hadith of Jibril. That is foundational insofar as Islamic epistemology is concerned. You have the outward understanding, you have the conviction in it, and then you have got a spiritual understanding of something. You've got the agent intellection, you've got active intelligence, and then you've got spiritual intelligence. These are processes that you have to go through. You have to master the outward sciences, you have to master the inward sciences, and then your heart has to be clean and pure, and you need to be on a process of purification for you to really come to the final understanding of absolute truth. Then you need to understand that true interpretation of reality or true understanding, the final piece of validation can only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The process of seeking out the truth through knowledge is a twofold journey. The first part of the journey is your soul arriving to meaning, meaning that you have gone through the process of looking at the outward and abstracting or extracting its essence, its meaning. You've gone through the symbolic processes, you've gone through the sciences themselves, and you've arrived at the meaning. You've arrived at an ontological understanding of something. 
Now comes the second half of the journey in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the nur. He gives you the meaning and the understanding of things. That's the second part of the journey where meaning arrives at the soul. And the soul itself has to be of a pure nature, has to be in a pure state for it to receive that understanding. And then the final piece, lastly, is to recognize foremost that all knowledge, whether it is earthly, or heavenly whether it is what you see in the science textbook or or you know it's a theory or an equation or whatever it is all knowledge comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of it may come through his prophets and messengers what we call revelation and 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 then some of it will come through other means asbab that he puts in place that people when they venture out to now to, to, to journey out into the world and to seek out understandings of reality and they happen upon these means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts upon on their path they then begin to have understandings of this reality and they, they come out and they give you an understanding of it they give you, they tell you okay this is the formula or this is the principle or this is how it was discovered or this is what happens in this instance all that knowledge ultimately contingently comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you must understand this not just in the words that are being applied but truly embody this understanding that he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his knowledge unto whomsoever he wills he and he is the one who gives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides his light unto whomsoever he wills and more importantly, he bestows it upon the one who seeks it with all his heart. Sincerely seeks it, not for some ulterior motive. Not that you're looking for knowledge so that you can make a YouTube video or that you can make some sort of prediction to figure out when Imam Mahdi is coming or whether the Dajjal is here yet or not. Not for those other, all those ulterior motives, but to, for solely for the, for the purpose of seeking an understanding, a sincere intention of seeking knowledge. Do not under any circumstance assume that just because you had an inspirational thought, you know, you had a certain understanding. You you sort of figured something out. You made a connection somewhere that no one has ever, no one else has ever made. Even though it might be coherent with the religion, like you you can sort of, uh, you know, derive an understanding and see. Okay, in the hadith, there is some coherency with what you have understood. Even though you had that, or you had some sort of a vision from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, some sort of a dream. You know, there's this character who is now on YouTube. I've seen. Um, I'm not sure what's his name, uh, something Qasim or something, Muhammad Qasim or something. And he now claims, you know, that he's having these divine dreams and whatnot. And he wants to be the Mahdi now, you know, he's the rightly guided one because he has had so many dreams. And we don't even know whether he has had those dreams or he just put two and two together after reading a couple of newspaper articles. But now he knows exactly what's going to happen with Pakistan and what's going to happen in Gaza and what's going to happen here. And so, you know, he thinks that he has this understanding this unveiling from god you know and he's now sort of enlightened do not ever take that sort of position my point that's my point do not ever take that sort of position if you take such a stance you will not only be deluding yourself with phantasms that are unbecoming of your intellect you are actually lowering yourself in grade than what allah has actually given you in rank as a human being you're lowering yourself further than that you know, you're, you're becoming demonic in that sense. You might be very smart, like you can really put the facts together and you can speak really fast and you can read really quick. You might be really smart in that sense, meaning your intellect is working, but that does not necessarily mean that you have knowledge. You might have a lot of information, like I mentioned in the beginning, that you have got memorized this text and that book and this thing and that book and, and all that does not necessarily mean that you have knowledge. You may have a lot of information, but you are in essence like a donkey laden with books. You do not want to lower yourself in that grade. And this also applies to now the other side of the spectrum because there are some people who then say things like, oh, Allah has not given me that knowledge. Allah has not given me that understanding. Allah has not done this. So, you know, you just sit there with your arms crossed and wait for things to happen or wait for, you know, mu you know Mufti to come and tell you what to do next. That's now the other extreme. That's just laziness. You know, that's just lethargy, which in, in itself is a, is a sin when you, when you do that. Because you've not actually even made an effort to pursue the truth. You've not made any effort to try and understand things, to try and figure things out. 
if you did not even try to learn to try and study then don't use god almighty as the excuse of not knowing something if you do not know learn it if you cannot find the answer seek it make the effort put the foot out of the door if you don't put the foot forward you will never embark on the journey and you will never move forward and you will never reach the truth in this case you will not reach the destination of true enlightenment this is the pursuit of truth these four axioms are important to understand then to embody and to apply in the study of eschatology and by and large any study whatsoever because ultimately we're all human beings and we all have the same fundamental nature and objective which is to seek out the truth whichever means we use whichever science we apply whichever art form we apply ultimately that is our objective to seek out the truth because the truth is what gives us enlightenment you can find these four principles in my book the one eyed imposter messiah and false messiah it is in the chapter under subjectivity and objectivity This is all the time we have for today. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiyun alim wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka antat tawwabur rahim. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Barakallahu fikum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khairan.